Praise God. So you all ready for today's yes. service? Yes. 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 Thank you, Lord. Well, I hope you all excited. Yes. Because I got something for you. Back when we were um, doing the book of Revelation. Who remembers the book of Revelation? Yes. Back yes. when we were doing the book of Revelation toward the latter or the end. We're getting toward the end. I asked the Lord. I said, Lord. I said, Lord. Oh. <laughs> You're like Brother Lewis. I said, Lord. <laughs> I said, uh, I said, Lord, this, this book is coming to an end here pretty soon, and I'm going to need to hear from you because, you know, when we, when we do a book, Pastor Jesse and I already have the subjects laid out. So you're talking about Revelation 1 through 22. So we don't have to really seek the Lord for a lot of subject, but we still have to seek the Lord for the need in the subject. In this case, because the book was coming to an end, I had to seek the Lord for the subject, back to the subject, and the need for the people. But this was back when we were ending the book of Revelation. I said, Lord, after Easter, I'm going to have to come up with my own message. I'm not going to have the subjects laid out for me and like, we, like we had in the book of Revelation. Amen. So he dropped a message in my spirit Amen. back then. And the title of today's message, if you're taking notes, is, Am I in the Right Church? Amen. Amen. I don't know why God gave me that a couple months ago, but that's what he gave me. And that's the sermon he gave me. Am I in the right church? How does one know that they're in the right church? Amen. What should be some of the most important things that one Christian or a believer should ask themselves when choosing a church for them or their families or and their families? Or do I even need to go to church? I mean, you know, I'm saved. I have a Lord in my life. Why do I need to go to a church building that can pray at home? Amen. Listen to what the he Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. You don't have to turn there right now, but it's in the King James Version. I'm going to read. So just listen. It says here, let us consider one another Hallelujah. to provoke. How many know you know what provoke means? Amen. Provoke unto love and to good works. Amen. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some. But exhorting one another, but exhorting one another. What Apostle Paul is telling us in Hebrews, we'll set the little uh, foundation for you guys for this particular message, is that it's important for every believer, believer to assemble in church. Come on. Amen? Amen. With, a, with a church body. So the title again is, Am I in the Right Church? I'd like uh, my handouts to be handed out. I got some handouts for you guys today. Be easy to follow along with because of the content. I figured it was much easier to do a handout than to kind of just tell you everything. So it's good when you see it. The eye is sometimes the better pupil than the ear. <laughs> and the title on top of your page is, Am I in the Right Church? Now some of you probably saw the Facebook maybe or the Instagram, and you probably thought, Oh, am I in the right church? Now this message is definitely for the body of Christ here, and it certainly is for the body of Christ at large. So when you've got your handouts, Y'all can just look up, because we don't want you reading ahead. It won't be the same if I'm explaining it, right? So y'all can read it, and it won't be as, I don't know, it won't be as exciting maybe. I don't know. So let's, let's get to this. Let's get to the group. So what I want to do first, before we start reading this, I want y'all to go with me to the actual scripture that I just quoted. I want you to go with me to Hebrews. When you, when you get settled in there with your handout, I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 10. I quoted from the King James Version, but I want to take you into the translation that we use, which is the New Living Translation. Mm -hmm. How many know the New Living Translation is more of an English paraphrase of the King James or the Bible? Amen? And what it does, it's more English, it's easier to understand, and so a lot of times uh, when you want to maybe know more, you want a parallel study. Parallel study means you use a couple of Bibles. You can use this Bible, and you can use a King James, but in the church, we use this Bible so we can follow along word for word, and you don't have to uh, uh, work your brain as hard to understand what the Scripture is saying. Amen? Amen. So we are there at Hebrews chapter 10. And, I'll, and it's going to be, we're going to start in verse 24, but don't read it yet. I want you to go all the way up in your Bibles, whether it's the House Bible. I'm not sure about the House Bibles, but in the subtitle, do you all see it says a call to persevere? Amen. Do you all see that or does yes. your Bible not have it? No. A call so in most of our Bibles, the subtitle on top is a call to persevere. So am I in the right church? Yeah. And here we are in Hebrews 10. I want to break that down a little bit because it's going to give you um, a, a more of a foundation about where we're going today in the message. So a call to persevere. Well, first of all, what does persevere mean? 
It means this, and listen to this. It's not in your Bible, but I got the note. To continue in a course of action, even in the face of difficulty. What's a synonym, a synonym for that? To persist, to carry on, to keep going, hammer away, to stand one's ground, or go the distance. Go in the distance. Y'all know that crazy rock song is. <laughs> when I wrote this down, I was thinking about that song. I don't know why. But anyway, to persevere in what? Jump down to verse 24. Because this takes perseverance. Y'all with me? 10 and 24 will be there. Am I in the right church? Do I even need to go to church? It says here in verse 24. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Amen. So what is verse 24 saying? It says, how are you going to motivate people to act good, good acts, good deeds and love if we're not here? Amen. It's important to gather and to assemble because when we come together, there's strength that you draw from the body of Christ that you're not going to get that kind of strength at home by yourself. Amen. Apostle Paul was telling these people, he says, you know, there are Christians during this time that were missing church. They weren't for whatever reason. They just weren't going to church. And we have that today. But there's also Christians today that love to come to church. And that's why y'all are here today on Sunday morning. Amen. Because you want to praise the Lord and thank Him. And it's like a memorial to Jesus every time Sunday morning comes. Hallelujah. Amen. And Apostle Paul is saying here that it, it's important. I'll give you an example. Let me give an analogy. You know when people go to war, the, the, the soldiers, and the soldiers go out in platoons. And their platoon goes out to war. They go out in groups, do they not? And it says they got to stick together unless they have certain instructions. But if one soldier lags behind, that soldier becomes what? An easy target. So the same is for the Christian. If we're all gathering together and one of the Christian soldiers begins to lag behind, then that, so that Christian soldier is just open for a target by the enemy. Amen. So that's why we gather together here to give you strength for your life. You come here, we deposit by the Holy Spirit and through the word of God, and you go out and live your convictions. Hallelujah. So we know that it's important now that we gather together to motivate each other to good works. When Pastor Jesse and I opened this church 10 years ago, we had to grow in our calling as well. And now we hope that when you come to church that you feel motivated to love. Amen. Love is not something we say, it's something that we display. Amen. If you are coming to church and you've been a Christian for any length of time, your love should not just be sitting here, it should be action out here, especially Amen. here in the local body. Amen. Somebody needs your love even today. Amen. Somebody needs a touch just to say everything's going to be all right. You know, I've just been praying for you. You don't have to ask them all their personal line. Don't ask them a bunch of personal questions. How many know that it's not healthy to know too much personal things about each other? Of course, unless in your own family, and, that, and that's different, But because you live with them. But I'm talking about it's just not healthy. You have to look at, keep your eyes on Christ even in conversation with other Christians. You say, we're praying for you. And if that person feels like they can open up to an elder in the church because they need prayer, that's something different. You know who to share that stuff with. But it's love. Love is an action. Love is a verb. It's not a noun. Amen. Amen. But if you're not here, you can't display and then you can't receive love in the assembly. Amen. So verse 25 says, let us not neglect our meeting together. Don't neglect it as some people do, but encourage one another. Especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. We are living in a day and age where people are growing weary. Right. I, I, I know because I, I live in a body too. The same kind of body y'all live in. I grow weary. But I train my spirit, man, that it needs to rise up and I need to be more than a comfort in Christ Amen. Jesus. If I missed church or didn't come to pastor you every time I didn't feel good, I'd probably miss about, you know, 15 or 20 a year <laughs> because it can't go by what I feel. I've got to go by what's real. And what's real to me is the cross of Christ, Amen. faith in God, and I know he's going to pull me through. Oh, Hallelujah. Amen. It's very important. A, a Christian believer who isolates themselves or thinks they can survive on their own opens the door for disaster spiritually to come into their life. And it begins with the spiritual, then it goes into the physical or sometimes the financial or vice versa. 
But the spiritual goals and then the rest follows. That's, right. That's why it's important. You're like, well, what could, you know, what could be important about being here? There are people that you know nothing about that come through here with some, I mean, horrific situations. And they come here just maybe three or four or whatever, five, and they keep, and you can see the healing that takes place yes. yeah. in their mind and their body. You can yes. see Hallelujah. that their spirit is lifted. You can see them be encouraged and they have yes. hope again in Christ Jesus. Yes. That's why we come to church. Amen. Amen. So now that we've established, now I also say this, what if Jesus came back when we were all sitting in church and you didn't come to church and you weren't here? What if he came and raptured us and you were at home in bed? Because you're so tired because you stayed up too late watching the movie on Saturday night. Yeah. You don't want to miss out. Don't let Jesus find you in a non-committal state when he returns. Amen. Amen. you got to live every day as if he was going to return that moment. Mm -hmm. And that's what I say. Lord, I'm looking for you. I'm looking for your appearing. Hallelujah. Amen. So now that, we, now that we know and know for sure now it's important to be in church. Now what I want to do is take you to. Let's see here. I want to take you to. I want you to go to the handout. Before we go to another scripture. Am I in the right church? <laughs> Am I in the right church? You got your hand out? Now, on the very first part, the subtitle, where it says the top five questions, I want you to take your pen, I hope you have a pen, and change that to four. I made a little boo-boo there. Just change that to four. You see, they have four underneath it. So am I in the right church? The top four questions you should ask yourself. Are we all together? Number one, is the Bible, Word of God, honored above all else? Hallelujah. Is the Bible of God honored above all else? Yes. Hallelujah. Don't we do that here? Now, I promise you, I didn't base these questions based on what we do. I did a lot of research, and these were some of the questions that people were, were asking themselves concerning um, these are the questions that you should ask yourself when looking for a church. Let me just put it like that. So the Bible, the Word of God, should be the number one thing in that church. That's the question you should ask. If you see that, then that's a probability for me, that church. Amen. Number two, does the pastor lead the congregation in reading the Bible and communicate sound, basic biblical doctrines and truths such as the cross of Christ, salvation, sin, the blood, and repentance? Oh, gosh, if, if the modern church even does one or two of those, we're doing good. Because there's some modern churches that don't even have that. And that's a very sad thing. And if they don't have the cross of Christ and they're not preaching salvation and they're not preaching repentance, then it's very possible that those people are not saved. That's right. That are, that are receiving Jesus under this type of ministry. It's sad. And then I want you to take your pen and I want you to add these doctrines. The Holy Spirit. And that little blank area next to repentance. The Holy the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. And even the nine gifts of the Spirit. Why do we need to preach the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit on the Holy Spirit? Because he's the only member of the Godhead on earth today. And sometimes the nine gifts of the Spirit, they are, I mean not sometimes, this is what they're for. They're to whip the world, the flesh, and the devil. If God comes in and uses Pastor or I to give you a word of knowledge he, or give you a prophecy, it may very well save you from making the wrong decision. That's what the gifts of the Spirit are for. But a lot of churches do not believe in the Holy Spirit. They don't believe certainly in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And they don't believe in the nine gifts of the Spirit. So those are the things you need to look for. And I'm telling you, when you're going to number two, by the time you get to number two, there's going to be real slim pickings up there. Real slim pickings. They're, they're, out, they're out there, but boy, they're like diamonds in the rough out there. They're kneeling in the haystack. You, they're out. We know a few, but we don't know many, unfortunately. Number three. Do I learn something, feel challenged, and or convicted when I hear the message? That's another important question that you have to ask yourself when picking a church. Do I learn something, feel challenged, or convicted when I hear the message? I want you to go with me to 2 Timothy, chapter 3. Are things reaching your spirit already? Yes. Is the word reaching? Yes. Are y'all being enlightened this morning? Yes. So when you get to 2 Timothy, chapter 3, I want you to go and start with me at verse 16. And when you got it, just say, I got it. Sure. 
And it goes. Now watch this. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. Everybody say with me, all scripture. All, all scripture. All scripture. All scripture. It means the Old Testament and it means the New Testament. Well, I thought the Old Testament was the old law. The Old Testament is a foundation upon which the New Testament rests. You, the Old Testament shadows is a shadow of who and what was to come. And that was Jesus Christ. The Old Testament cries out for a savior. And the Old Testament is a revealing of what the New Testament will be fulfilling. Woo! So they are both. You've got it. Our old pastor, you know, rest her soul. She's been gone to the Lord, gone to be with the Lord about, what, seven or eight years now. But she used to tell us the Old Testament and the New Testament is like a tapestry. Y'all, you've shown me the warp and the wolf. You've got the warp and then you've got the wolf, the New Testament. The warp is the old and then the wolf is the New Testament. It goes together. And a lot of pastors don't know how to interface scripture where scripture complements scripture because the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, old and past, Old Testament and before that. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. How many know Jesus Christ was in the book of Genesis? The Holy yes. Spirit, Jesus, and God Almighty were in the book of Genesis. Amen. The plan of redemption, the plan of Jesus Christ was always there before. Before we were even a thought. Hallelujah. Amen. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Bible says in Jeremiah to stick to the old ways because it will keep us on the path of peace and the path of righteousness. Amen. So let's get back to Timothy. He says all scripture is inspired by God and useful to teach us, oh, I've got to be taught, what is true. And to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. What does that mean? It convicts us. Right. It, it might even offend us sometimes. But that's good for you. How I many know it's healthy to be offended for the right reason? Amen? And in the right way. It goes on to say this. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us what teaches us to do what is right. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. So correction is now a bad word in church. It's just a bad word. We, I can't correct people because I may offend them. I don't want to instruct people because they may get offended. They may leave the church. The Bible, the Bible strictly or specifically says that the word of God will do that. It will correct us. It will teach us. It will instruct us. That's what we hear because from Genesis to book of Revelation is full of instruction, full of direction, full of correction. Why? Because the flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. Amen. We need the Word of God with the Holy Spirit. We need the power of God. Amen. Not just in letter only, but in power. Yeah. And it goes on to say in verse 17, God uses it to prepare and equip His people to do every good work. Every time we preach or every time we get behind this pulpit, we didn't know we were going to have a helps team 10 years ago. We didn't know that people were going to be preaching within the 10 years that we were open. We didn't know that we were going to have more than one person called to preach in this ministry, because we do. And I just say, hallelujah to that. Hallelujah to that. God is preparing and equipping. The number one thing that a pastor is to do in a ministry who's in charge of a flock is to what, pastor? Equip the same. Equip the saints for service. Amen. And that is the vision. Our vision is the end result of what we do. What we do, our mission is serving God and serving one another. Our vision is equipping the saints for service, which should be every pastor's number one vision when they have a local body. They're in charge of a local flock. Amen? That's our job. Is that good or is that good? Amen. Go to chapter 4. I solemnly urge you in the presence of God in Christ Jesus, who will someday judge the living and the dead. What that means is that there will be judgment at the rapture. The dead will rise, meet in the air. We who are alive, if Jesus returns when we're alive, then we'll meet them in the air and we'll all go to be with the Lord and we'll all head to the Bema Seat. He will judge both of us or both sets of us, all of us, because we're all in heaven now. He will judge us based on our works, what we did as a Christian. He won't judge our sin because it was already judged when we received Jesus Christ while we were living in the earth. Amen. 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 So he, it says here, I solemnly urge in the presence of God in Christ Jesus, who will someday judge the living and the dead. And there's other judgments, but I'm not going to get into the other judgments right now. When he appears to set up his kingdom, preach the word, preach the word of God. That's for us. 
leaders who are in charge of, of feeding the flocks or feeding flocks preach the word of God. What are you preaching, pastors? I don't get it. I've been a pastor for a long time. I don't understand. I can't even get the messages. Where What is going on? I won't even recognize some of the messages that are coming out of certain pulpits or, uh, you know, just different people who preach and they they uh, don't want to preach the word because it might not entertain their people. So preach the word, the Bible says. Preach the word of God. Be prepared. If you're not in leadership, what does that mean for you? It means share the love of Jesus. Share the cross. Amen. You make sure that person is saved. You make sure. Have you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? They start telling you their problems. Have you made Jesus Christ Lord of your life? Woo! Have you ever yes. received Jesus as your Lord? That's the open door. You go in and you take that opportunity. That's what your job is for a lay person in the body of Christ. Amen. You have a ministry too. It's just not behind the pulpit, but it is out there amongst the world and the lost. Amen. Amen. So preach the word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Do we do that here? Yes. Do we bring forth the word of God and take you and, and take you to help you understand and read verse by verse and break it down? Yes. Are we afraid to, to preach the bad stuff? I mean, the bad stuff all about the sin and judgment. Are we afraid to preach that here? No, because we need all of it. Amen. Amen. It says, be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Whether Pastor Jesse and I feel good or not, we come up here and preach like we're preaching to a thousand people. Amen. Amen. And we're ready. Amen. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. Oh my gosh, there's the correct word again. There's rebuke again. Oh my gosh, you've got to rebuke. Some people might get offended sometimes. We, sometimes we have to deliver messages that are a little bit more intense than others. Because we don't, we don't know where the people are, but that's just what the Holy Spirit says to do. But I tell you, some of y'all keep coming back so you know it's good for you. Amen? Because it causes you to want to make a change. It yes. causes you not to want to live the same way you used to live. It causes you to want to start leaving the world behind and get on uh, the path to Jesus Christ and walk with Him the rest of your days. Amen? That's how you know you're in the right church. You ask yourself these questions. Now you're going to have them with you. So every time you question it, well, is this going on in my church? Is this going on? That's how you know you're in the right church. And for those of you watching by YouTube, ask yourself these questions. If you're in a church and maybe you're not happy or maybe something, you feel like something's missing, ask yourself these questions and God will lead you. Amen. Amen. I want you to go back to your handout real quick. And I want you to go to number four. It's, good. it's about to get gooder and gooder in here. Amen. It's about to get gooder. Number four. Does the church focus? Now remember, am I in the right church? Here's the number fourth question. Here's the number four question. Does the church focus more on programs, outreaches, ministries, presentations, entertainment, music and worship, and activities more than teaching the people the word of God? That is a big one. I'm telling you. We got people looking for a church based on number four and not really worried about one through three. And that's the era and the day and age we're living in. Mm -hmm. People don't know because the word of God has been so lost in all of these things. People assume that the more activities and the more things the church has, that means that's the church for me. And oh my gosh, they better have a children's ministry because if they don't have a children's ministry, then that means that's not the church for me and my family. It doesn't matter what the pastor's preaching. If he's just preaching a feel-good message, as long as they have a children's ministry, that's all that matters to me for my child to have somewhere to teach. How many know it's not the responsibility of the church? To raise the child in the spiritual things. It's the responsibility of the parent. And the reason we have the church, uh, the kids program the way we are going to do it is because it puts the responsibility on, back on the parent to help raise the child in church and teaches them obedience, which then transfers into the home life. Amen. Amen. And how does the parent do it? They come to church. They get fed the word. They are led. We have elders here that will lead those types of things to help the parents. And the church and the parents work together in the church Amen. to find out solutions on how to raise children and mature them in the faith. Amen. Hallelujah. And that's how we're doing it. I don't know what God has in the future, future, but that's what we're doing right now. Hallelujah. Amen. I don't like to plan. I, I, I'm, I am a planner, and I sometimes I get crazy about planning things a year out. Oh, shit. I have to really say, Lord, I go, sure, please help me. I'm a planner. I plan things way out. I'm scheduled like way out. And I just, I have to say, Lord, I have to enjoy the moment because I get so far ahead of myself. But 
for now. That's what we're doing in this ministry. And that's how you know we have children here that are growing. And we've had testimonies of the children that have been in this program. We did a pilot program for a while to see if it would work. And the children are changing. The children and the parents are saying the children are not the same. They are changing. I see changes. It doesn't happen overnight like from one Sunday to the next. But it happens. You just got to stay faithful. You got to stay assembled together in the church God has called you to. Amen. So number four, does the church focus on more programs, outreaches, ministries? I'm telling you, church, you will never see a trapeze artist and a circus in this ministry. You're not going to see a circus at Christmas time and charge you whatever amount of money to come to our church to see a circus act. <laughs> Pastor Jesse and I went to a circus. We went to Cirque du Soleil as a way of doing something not spiritual, something we could just go and not have to think, not have to be a pray and not have to be uh, studying the word of God, just go and just somebody entertain us for a while so we can feel like a normal person, like normal people for a while. And we went to the circus and I said, and I saw the Cirque du Soleil and they were doing all their, you know, uh, acrobatics and I mean, just incredible things these people do. And I said, that was in a church this past Christmas and it's every Christmas. And I say to myself, what has happened to the church? Trying to stay hip, trying to stay cool. You know, parents want to be cool. I want my kid to be my best friend. That's happening in the church. That's, right. That's happening in the church. Wanting to have petting zoos for Easter and trying to get your kids into the church because if they get your kids, they can get you. Amen. 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 Oh, amen. No words. And, and, and let me tell you, watch this. Thank you, Pastor. Watch the next part. Underneath it, underneath number four, it says, if the church does a lot of number four and not enough one, two, three, then it's probably a good idea to start praying for a one, two, three church. <laughs> there are people that actually choose a church based on number four rather than number three right. because they don't know. They don't know. How many know that when a church has multiple programs, I'm talking ministry after ministry after ministry, they would not need all those ministries if they just come back to the word of God in the pulpit. Amen. You've got divorce ministry. You've got a grief ministry. And I'm not kidding. You've got anger ministry. Amen. You have um, a came out of jail ministry. You have prison ministry, which I'm not talking about going. I'm talking about, well, people that just freshly come out of prison. So, yes, a prison ministry of that sort. We have um, recovery ministry. We have drug ministry. All in one church. Just get back to the Word of God. And then you know what they try to do? They try to fill your dance card from Monday through Saturday so that every night, we have, we have churches doing uh, uh, game nights. Game nights. Let me tell you, the church was not set up originally to fill your dance card. That's not what a church is for. A church is to feed you spiritually so you can go out and live your life. Amen. That's what the church is for. If we're doing our spiritual deposit with the word of God, I promise you, you won't need a thousand ministries. But if I can attack every area that people go through, I can get everybody to come to my church because they'll come to something. Because I got Monday through Saturday rolling here. Does everybody understand? Amen. That's the modern churches that we are around. And Pastor Jesse and I decided we are not competing with that. No. no. We are not competing. We are never going to compromise. If we stay small till Jesus comes, we stay small till Jesus comes. Amen. I'm okay. I know, our, I know our sheep by name. We know our sheep by name. We know what's going on. We stay connected with you all. We love on you all. And that's important. If it grows a little bit, then that means that we're ready for that growth. Amen. If God wants to do it, he'll add as he pleases. And that's where Pastor Jesse and I have come to. Because it's not getting better out there. Everybody wants to be big and they're trying to compete with each other. Because they want to be the bigger church. They want to get all the people in. How many know those are compromising churches? That's, right. That's just the bottom line. Compromising churches. We're not going to do it to be big. We're going to stay here and we're going to feed the word of God. And y'all are going to grow by leaps and bounds in God. And you're going to see things in your life change. Because the word is put first. Jesus yeah. says, I esteem my word even above my own name. Yeah. He said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word, my word, not my 10,000 ministries, my word shall remain forever. Amen. Amen. And that's what we do here, the word of God. And it will bring change. It will bring healing because it's medicine and healing to what? All our flesh. How many know we need some healing in our flesh? Amen. We need some healing in our mind. Amen. With all the hustle and bustle out there, we need some healing and some peace in our mind. We need to learn how to rest Amen. in the Lord. Y'all enjoy that? Yeah. So we're going to finish up here with these four. So how does someone know when it's time to leave a church? Number one. 
They no longer respect the pastor and his leadership or her leadership, so it's hard to receive from him or her. One of the biggest things that we can see just from people preaching is the kind of language they use. That there's something gone, they've gone rogue. <laughs> Pastors have gone rogue. The kind of language that starts to come out of their mouth. Real slangy, very um, using certain words that are not appropriate. Um, uh, very, like just, just copying the same way the world talks. I mean, on the fine, um, skating on the, on the edge with the language, that's how you know. It's like, uh-oh. And pastors don't realize when they begin to do that, they do begin to lose respect of their congregation. They just won't say because they're not going to go tell the pastor anything. They lose respect. Number two, the word of God is not honored above all else. Too much emphasis on self-help, feel-good messages, motivation, philosophy, and psychology. Am I in the right church? You won't hear a lot of that here. You'll hear fun things here and there. But Pastor Jesse and I, we stick to the word and we use the word to teach you all. Amen? Amen. Too much emphasis on the self-help, feel-good, motivation, philosophy, and psychology. Too much of that. Not enough or not the word of God. Because the word of God to them maybe has become dry. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is absent. Right. He's absent. So that pastor feels they have to do this and they have to do that. And they got to go do this work. They got to do these works. And they got to do all these things. And let me tell you, the end result of those people is spiritual, is a spiritual decline. And you can see it. Number three, pastor preaches only blessings, but not obedience or instruction because they don't want to offend anyone. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Pa the pastors will preach all the blessings. Well, we don't want to hurt anybody. So we want to make you all feel wonderful. We want you to leave really encouraged. How many know the word of God is encouraging? Yes. All of it, not just the blessing part of it. Can you imagine raising your kids, those of you who have kids, and you only reward them and bless them, but you never correct them? That's the kind of church modern that's rising up in this day and age. Can you imagine having doing that with your children and not ever correcting them? What kind of child do you think is just going to turn out to be? There's not going to be much hope there because the child didn't know boundaries at an early, early age. Right. We need to have boundaries. How many know our flesh as adults? It has to be given boundaries or we'll get off and we'll go because the flesh, I tell you, if you give it too much, you give it an inch, it takes a mile. Amen. We were telling, we've told people over the years, people that I'm going to be in church every Sunday. I'm going to be here. And oh gosh, I just know that's where I'm going to be. And then we just wait and then they, they'll miss one. I said, okay. Then a couple weeks go by and they'll miss another. How many know you give the flesh an inch, it will take a mile. Yeah. And it will start to feel normal to miss church. How many know that's a dangerous place to be? Don't let Jesus find you in a laxed attitude toward him when he returns. Amen. Yeah. Number three. Or, number four, the church focuses on entertainment. This is when you know it's time to leave. On entertainment, programs, activities, and lots of ministries instead of filling and feeding the people with the word of God. And unfortunately, spiritual deprivation is the result. And even worse, a backslidden condition. Now, a backslidden person can take place in anybody's church. doesn't matter how Holy Ghost filled. doesn't matter how much word. You're going to have backslidden people in every church. That's just the way it is. That's normal. But at least the pastor can't never say, was it because I wasn't preaching the word of God? Was it because I wasn't delivering the message the way God told me? I got caught up in wanting to grow my church and using the world's methods to get the church to come in. And we've heard, I've heard so many pastors over the years say, oh, it doesn't matter what method we use to get them in here. As long as the message doesn't change, if you continue to use worldly methods to get them into the church, eventually your message will change. Woo! Because you've got a bunch of worldly people that you seduce to come in and bribe to come into the church. And then you wonder why they're not growing. Amen. And I'm not saying every single person and every single time. But it's a lot of it. And then you have the world in your church. And then if your church is not preaching the word. And it's not, 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 being, not uh, giving the Holy Spirit latitude. It's going to affect the congregation. Amen? Because there's no preaching against sin. There's no preaching of repentance. There's no preaching about the cross of Christ. We've left all of those doctrines for other things. Go with me back to 2 Timothy chapter 4. And we're going to finish up here in this area. How many of you are really learning something today? 
the Holy Spirit has laid it out. I didn't want to be in a rush today. I didn't want to be, I just wanted to just give it to you on a handout because I felt when you see it, instead of just me explaining everything, it really comes to life, especially the way I'm doing the teaching today. It's a little unorthodox how I normally, um, how I presented this today. Verse 3, are we there? Amen. It says, For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. There's a time coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. Stop right there. We've had people visit over the years here since we've been in this building. And they'll come in and they come from commercial churches. They'll come from other places. Um, and, and they'll come in and they'll go, I just want to come here because I heard you want to do this teaching or that teaching. And they'll come in and sit and they're so excited because they'll say, well, our church doesn't teach stuff like this. And they'll sit here and be all excited about the teaching. And they'll come once, they'll come twice, and you'll never see them again. And it's because they come from places that where the pastor doesn't correct anybody. They come from places where the pastor doesn't preach the entire counsel of God. How many know waving your Bible in the air like you just don't care is not enough to get your people taught in the Word of God? You can wave that Bible all day long and still be dead man walking or dead man walking. You got to open it, pastors. You got to take your people to the scriptures. Read the scriptures. And at least when you read a scripture, at least let your message be about the scripture that you shared with the congregation. I love it when pastors, you can always tell when they're not prepared. They go up, they open, they got this great scripture. And then by the time they go to the third sentence to do a, a commentary or share with, with the people, they're off on some other subject because they're not prepared. Why? Because they're doing programs and outreaches and ministries and presentations and entertainment and music and worship and they're into all that and you can tell that there's a there's a suffering in the growth of the people you can see it. Yes. so people want to feel good people want they don't want to be told how to live they don't want to be told how to uh grow in god they don't want to be instructed they don't want to be corrected they don't want to be redirected so it goes on to say this they will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. We had a visitor come in months and months ago, probably over a year ago. Came with children. Brother Jesse is our one of our elders, and he comes and he'll, you know, if he needs, if he, if he gets aggressive, he'll have to say something. Well, that person was extremely rude to him. I mean, really, really rude to him. Ain't everybody knows Brother Jesse back there? There's not a rude bone in his body. Amen. I mean, he, he probably just probably said, oh, she's, she's, you know. no, no telling what he said, but you, you can't hear him because he's so quiet. And, you know, he's not, there's not a rude bone in Brother Jesse's body. And for that person, they came from some other church, from some other place, for that person to get upset about just instructing about, you know, the child to be quiet or not to be quiet, but, you know, to quiet down or to just be real, uh, he just wanted to give an instruction. And it was very nice. For someone to get that upset, you can tell that they come from a church where the pastor never corrects That's and nobody right. ever says anything right. and the child just goes and goes. You can tell. And, and the thing is, is that that's not the only person that's ever felt offended when they've come here since we've been open. But hopefully we get more systems in place with the help of the Holy Spirit Amen. that we continue to go forward. We continue to be very, uh, we explain our instructions. We give direction. We do it through the word. We do it in person so that everybody feels okay and no one gets offended when we have to instruct you a little bit. Amen. Amen. It's healthy to run a church that way. Because every, every, God's a God of order in our church and every church of God needs decency and in order because it's run by the Lord and with the help of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 So it says here, let's finish up. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. You know what that means? Chase after false belief. Chase after a false idea. We have so many uh, churches that are presenting false ideas of who God is, right. a false belief of the kind of God we serve. Let me tell you, God is a good God, but he's also, like Pastor Jesse says, he's a just God. Amen. He's a just God, and He, does, he his desire for us is to live holy. He says, be ye holy, for I am holy. Can I get some music, Pastor? Amen. you got to live a holy life. you got to understand why you're in church. You got to understand and say, Lord, am I in the right church? If you're getting the word, if you're getting, if you're getting fed and you feel offended at times when the word's going forth, that's a good thing because that means you're going to grow in God. 
that means that the Holy Ghost is just in there. He's got, he got the, he's got the finger in your face, just like this. Oh, I gotta get that together. Oh, I gotta. Oh Lord, I gotta come Amen. out of that. Oh Lord, I don't want to do that. Amen. Oh Lord, that's church. Woo. That Amen. is church. We're not the all in all here. Everybody, stand to your feet. We're not the all in all church. We're not the one and only. We're one of many probably out there, at least in our country and abroad. But we're a true church that's not afraid to teach the entire counsel of God. We're not just concerned about filling chairs. That is not our number one concern. We're concerned about filling people with the word of God. We're concerned about filling you with the wisdom and the knowledge and understanding of God's word. We're concerned about equipping you for service. Even if it's just to serve and get people saved when you're out and about in your life, in your daily life. There's an equipping that takes place and the pastors have lost sight of that. Having so many ministries and keeping everybody so busy doesn't necessarily mean that that's a church that's full of the anointing. It just means that church does a lot of work. <laughs> and the word of God can get lost in that. The pastors can get lost in that. You can ask yourself these questions and take your hand out home after the service is over and say, am I in the right church? I pray the Lord confirm that you are because you didn't come here by accident. No one can come except the Father draw them. And Pastor Jesse and I, Long time ago, the Lord said, you fill the pulpit, the pulpit, and I'll fill the church. That's what God told us. Yeah. We fill the pulpit, not with empty words, not with swelling words, not with being great orators of words, not with being trained speakers, but we fill it with the word of God so that his people can be blessed. Am I in the right church?